and in our lives we are challenged especially with so many things happening around us and i like what um Herman said the other day, his, him and his wife was at, at a stage of, he said, decluttering, you know, decluttering. I, th I thought that's like a good uh, word that sometimes, especially when we're so full of things and there's so many things happening, uh, we need that space to actually just get rid of sometimes the weights or the stuff or the things uh, to be able to hear what God is saying. So I want to pray for us, and then we're going to talk a bit about the true gospel and the simplicity of the gospel and what God calls us to in this time. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are here. Thank you that your presence, Lord, in your presence there is fullness of joy. Thank you that, uh, brethren, when we dwell together in unity, there you come and command a blessing, life forevermore. And this morning we commit ourselves to that life Thank you that every person that's sitting here is special and has been handpicked by you to be here this morning. And Holy Spirit, you, you are the teacher. You're the one who inspires, who gives life, who breathes on us, who gives us, Lord, understanding. So open the eyes of our understanding to see, to know, and to be obedient Christians, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that as we commit to discipleship and your word this morning, that there's a place for each one at the table. Lord, it's not secondhand stuff, it's revelation. And we ask that you will bring us to your heart again this morning. And at the beginning of the year, Lord, as we consecrate this year and our families to you, we say, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done as it is in heaven. Amen. Okay, I already mentioned that. But um, part of our vision statement <clears throat> is to reach nations and generations through discipleship, leadership development, and church planting. And it was um, great this holiday. We did a, I did a, welly, a wedding there in southern Natal and drove through Transkei. And then we went to visit uh, some of the pastors and mission stations and things. And it was just amazing to see when people grab hold of what God wants to do and His kingdom coming. You know, so, um, <clears throat> so we visited Darbury and Mina, who was, they were district leaders here. He's an optometrist and they went to plant a church in in Port Elizabeth and just visiting them and their children and uh, they've got small children and just seeing the excitement for the gospel and what they're doing um, is, is so great to know that that vision is actually happening in our lives. But it means that each one of us need to embrace it not as like, oh, show for us vision or see us as vision or somebody else's vision. But, but what does that mean? Because it starts, discipleship starts in your home. Uh, leadership development starts in your home. We can't wait for the children's church teachers to teach your children. Church planting starts in your home. Um, it's, it starts in a place where you and I embrace the call of God on our lives. And it's really just the Great Commission. <laughs> you know, um, it's really just that place where you and I commit ourselves to the gospel. But I think a lot of people today, they don't know what is the true gospel. And, and how should that have an effect? Because I think a lot of people tr is trying to change the gospel. There's a lot of isms that's coming through the church, and especially through charismatic churches like ours. I don't know if you've read some of this stuff, but even in our nation, they make people drink petrol and do stuff, and the weirdest things are happening. And I think more than ever, you and I need to commit ourselves and ask God for discernment, ask God for wisdom, um, not to know what we are against, but to know what we are for. I mean, <laughs> you know, they, a guy once told me that um, he was in the narcotics and in the police service, and, and he was, he was in, involved mainly in identifying uh, fake uh, money, you know. So they had to, like, really go and search where, where does all the fake money comes, come from and all of that stuff. And... And he said something that stuck with me. He said that um, the most of the training was not to identify the fake, but to study the real thing. So that whatever different type of 200 rand note will come across your path, you will immediately recognize it because you know the true thing. So then you're not always just against stuff or trying to react to other things, but you're actually standing for something. You know what the true thing is. And when you know what the true thing is, you can apply faith to that true thing. And then it's so easy uh, to not just live in reaction, but to live in response uh, to that job description that this specific policeman had. 
And so, so I realized like, and God spoke so much to me about that because he said, study the real thing. Know what the word says. I love what Smith Wigglesworth, I think it was Smith Wigglesworth. He says, study even or read a lot of books, Christian books he was talking about, but live in the Bible. He says, read a lot of Christian books, but live in the Bible. Sure. So what, what you know, I want to take us here in Romans 1. This is a statement uh, Paul makes. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So when, when we commit ourselves to the gospel, he says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because I've discovered it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes that. Because you need to apply that. You need to believe it. You need to live the gospel every day. Because in this gospel, the righteousness, a true and just relationship with God is revealed. And therefore you shall live by faith, the just, those who've been made just, those who've been made justified, that you're not ashamed anymore, you're not condemned anymore, but it's a thing that you need to apply every day. Because the accuser is going to say to you, oh, you messed up, you didn't spend enough time with God over the holidays, you're such a bad Christian, look what you did again. And then after we've repented, God justifies us. He makes us not guilty. What an amazing concept, what an amazing place to be at that we are completely forgiven that even when that accusation comes against you when you stand righteous before jesus before the father you are free turn to your neighbor and say god doesn't hold it against you but the devil does so romans is probably the best book to study the all the doctrines on salvation all the all the things that God wants to release, you know, just justification and identification and propitiation and predestination and all that stuff. If you want to really study doctrines, you need to study the book of Romans, which is great. And this is why Paul says here, I, when, when, when I commit myself to the gospel, to this kingdom of God, to know God, to stand it, it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen? Amen. <laughs> There's the, there's the power of God begins to manifest. But when we start to compromise the gospel, the power leaves. Lives don't change. We become religious. We become Pharisees and Sadducees. And that's why he says that justification, that place where you and I are free before God is such a gift from God. It's nothing else can give it to you that you are forgiven. You are free before Jesus and because of the blood of Jesus. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some remarks just quickly. We're going to talk about the sim first the simplicity of the gospel. Listen to this. You know, in Mark chapter 1, it starts, and this is the account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is gospel? Gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, the good news of Jesus Christ. It is good news. It's not old news. They asked Reinhard Bunker once, they said, isn't the gospel getting old? He says, No. It's fresh. And if you preach the original gospel, the real gospel, you will get the real results of that gospel. So in 1 Corinthians 15, listen to this. He says, Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which is also you received and which you stand. You have to stand in the gospel. By which you also are saved. If you hold fast that words I preached to you. He says, you must hold fast onto this message because there's a lot of, other things that's going to challenge you and I as believers, especially in this time that we're living. He says, by which you also saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I think a lot of people don't even know that a lot of even theology schools in South Africa are, are not actually accepting the, birth, the virgin birth and the resurrection of Christ anymore. They say it didn't really happen. That's our big theology schools. So they've walked away from the gospel in essence. And that's why what I said, which, which you receive, there's a power because the resurrection is one of the greatest miracles that has ever happened. The virgin birth talks about that. And that's why we have to commit ourselves to that. So the next question is, what then is the center of the gospel? What, what is the gospel focus? This good news 
that we have in our own lives that, that brings us to justification and brings the sinners out there to God, to know God, and then also sanctification. What does that mean? The Afrikaans say, heilig maken. Okay? The gospel has this effect. Once you are saved, you've been justified, but then your whole life, the gospel will cause sanctification. Heilig maken. A place where you live out and you need to submit to it and be transformed by this gospel. The center of the gospel, listen to this. <clears throat> Paul goes on. And he says, because this was the, the most learned guy ever, you know, Pharisee of the Pharisees, he knew everything, was in the theology schools, all that stuff. And listen, his attitude when he comes, we've, we've, we've heard this so many times. He said, I'm brethren, when I came to you, did not come to you with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wis human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He says, this is my attitude. You know, I, I come to you, I've got all this stuff. I can tell you so much stuff, but I determined. I set my mind. Maybe this be our prayer for this year. I set my mind and I determined myself <clears throat> to not know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's really what revival is. Lots of people are praying for revival. Saying, Lord, bring revival in our land. But revival is to revision, to revisit what Christ has done. It's not going to be an adding on because some people think, oh, the supernatural, that brings revival. Or, or this other thing. But a revival is a true heart response to the cross. To revisit, to, to see, to vision what Christ has done. And this is what Paul determines himself. He says, I've determined determined i've set myself out because i know in this life there's going to be so many distractions there's going to be so many stuff that i need to focus but i determined not to know anything among you not fancy words not great stuff but i determined to know among you jesus christ and him crucified i mean so you're very quiet i know you're thinking but otherwise, if, if we allow too much clutter in our lives, we lose the simplicity of knowing Christ and knowing Him. Paul, Paul wrote it later. He says, you know, I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. I want to be conformed to the image of His death. Listen to this in Hebrews chapter 12. The writer says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. At this stage he says, I'm forgetting what lies behind and I'm stretching myself out to the prize, the upward call of Christ. Because we're running a race this year you're going to run a race there's going to be a lot of challenges there's going to be a lot of distractions there's going to be a lot of giants in front of you but looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith isn't isn't that amazing if you know that your life story has been written god has got a he's an author <laughs> he's written the story of your life so I, I have a friend that always said you know whatever comes my way it's either god sent or god used God will use every opportunity. Scripture says that he will make all things work together for good to those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. So, so when I determine myself, I'm going to run this race. I'm going to look to Christ. This is, this is the thing. I'm going to stay in that revelation, in that joy of my salvation. And um, that's what I, what I love, especially if I have some brothers in Malawi and Kenya and stuff and They've just grasped, grasped some stuff of, of your testimony and what God has done, you know. And I want to encourage us, share what God has done in your life as many times as possible. Share your testimony. Share your life story. Don't become a quiet Christian. Because in that life is revealed. We stay with that simplicity of, I've been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. Sure. I've been called out of darkness. I was dead and now I'm alive. <laughs> so I don't need to get life. I don't need to 
add a lot of things to make me sufficient or fulfilled. I have life. I have the all-sufficient one. I am satisfied in Christ because I was dead. I wasn't panel beaten to become a better person. I was dead in my trespasses and my sins, and I've become alive in Christ. I mean, have you ever have you ever visited somebody that had like a major heart attack, and they were on the brink of dying, and then they sort of came out of it, and either through a healing or doctors doing stuff, and and they come out, and then suddenly they are so thankful. Suddenly they just don't take things for granted. Why? Because just life in itself means so much to that person. Wow, I have a relationship. I've got another chance. That's what God has given us. I've, I'm, I'm an eternal being, and I, and I cannot be rooted here. And that's why the center of this gospel is, it says, lay aside every weight, the stuff that the world throws on us, lay it aside. The sins that so ensnares us, that entangles us like a spider's web, break it down, repent of it, and, and move on. Now, the, I'm not going to focus too much on this. You can, you can um, read about this in Galatians. But we must also know that there are a lot of other gospels. A lot of other gospels in Galatians 1 verse 8 to 11 you know, Paul starts and he says, but even we or an angel from heaven preach any, if we preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. There's a whole, the whole Galatians thing. The book of Galatians is about these group of Jews that wanted to bring back, you know, circumcision and all the Old Testament rituals and all that stuff. And now he fights with them and he says, you are accursed if you preach another gospel <laughs> because we can't crucify Jesus again. But even today in the modern church, in the charismatic church, we must know that there are a lot of other gospels being preached. I don't want to spend too much on that because, again, we don't want to just be against stuff. But today we need wisdom and discernment to know what is the gospel, the real gospel that we are standing for. And what is the power of that gospel? I just mentioned some, and hopefully we, we're speaking about it today, this week and next week, about the true gospel. Maybe we'll get back a little bit to that. But other gospels is a gospel of hyper grace. A gospel, I'm just talking about gospels in the charismatic church today, of prosperity. Yeah, in the rural areas, we get a lot of gospels of, of the law. The, uh, we call it the Jewish rite or rituals, where you have to go back into the Old Testament and rediscover all this stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that stuff, but we cannot apply the law again. The law is just a tutor. It a, is a, shows us, it's a shadow of what Jesus came to do. And then probably the most challenging one is a man-centered gospel we can make it almost like a humanistic or a carnal but so much that's happening in the charismatic church today is is a motivational aspect of the gospel that is very true god wants to motivate us we are overcomers in christ but if there's just motivation without any sacrifice that motivation makes the gospel center in on the need of the human being first and not on the need of God. And that is a very, very challenging thing to discern. Because some churches build the whole gospel or focus on the needs of man. And I'm not, I'm not against coffee and all the nice stuff and all... But so many people always consider what, what are the people going to think? What are they going to say? What is, what is going to make our church grow more? Because we need the numbers and we need the finances and we need all of that stuff. And then slightly what begins to happen is you begin to not say what the true gospel says and you begin to compromise on that. And there is a motivational aspect. Hey, we, we need encouragement and it's very biblical in our communities. But it becomes so subtle that sometimes... We say, no, no, the needs of man is more important than the needs of God. And then what happens, and you can just see it, it's very simple. There is no fear of God. There is no repentance. There is no changed lives because the power of God cannot manifest. The Holy Spirit doesn't really feel welcome. But it, it's a very subtle thing. And, and I'm not against encouragement because we need encouragement. We need to come together and rejoice and celebrate, and that's amazing. But that can't, cannot be the main focus of the gospel. Are, are you with me today? I'm, I'm just throwing in some stuff so you go and think about it. You, 
go and pray pray through that you know because yes there is grace and we believe in the grace of god and we should move in the grace of god and we're motivated by the love of god but grace is an enablement to do god's will it's not a ticket ticket for sinning it's not a, a ticket for not being accountable to god and not having the fear of god but i don't i don't want to focus too much on that it's just to to throw out some things are, are you still with me okay so so let's let's move on let's focus a bit on the power of, of the gospel we spoke about the simplicity of the gospel the center of the gospel but what is the power of the gospel listen to this in matthew 9 then jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease teaching preaching and healing <laughs> some people just say oh only the word of god we should only be word focused and other people say no no only the supernatural focused but jesus did all of it and so to have a healthy perspective on the gospel means that we need to be living in the word of god but that word of god calls us to be to to, to be obedient and to live out the power of god where the holy spirit feels welcome so it's not this one or that one it's both so he was teaching he was preaching and that means to proclaim to a lost world out there teaching the disciples teaching the people that were committed and that's why church should be about teaching but then there's also preaching proclaiming that is a proclamation of what christ came to do we cannot just become spiritual fat christians and say oh this is so lacquer church is so great because now we understand things that is amazing but you cannot have just teaching and no preaching preaching is proclamation but you cannot just have preaching and no teaching because people need to be discipled people need to grow and you cannot just have teaching and preaching without the fullness of god manifesting in people's lives it was so amazing the, the other day i was talking to to somebody that <clears throat> has not grown up in church and and the person sort of in i think it was july next year or last year not next year <laughs> july last year told me about this this experience they had with god because somebody with a small group prayed for that person specifically and that that guy is not is is not been in church or around church or grown up in church but the power of the god, of god manifested in his life in such a way because he um he sort of started to get heart problems because of all the gymming stuff he, he used and all those things um, and then he ended up in hospital and he thought he was going to die for a whole month and all that stuff and then then he cried out to jesus and jesus stepped into his life and changed his life forever but it wasn't man-made it was supernatural <laughs> and and when somebody when jesus walks into somebody's life it changes their life for eternity when it's a real experience with him and so we need the experience but now that guy is so clueless you have to show him <laughs> this is what christians do <laughs> this is how we live can you say i mean <laughs> thank you for your enthusiasm over there <clears throat> now next week we're going to talk about another thing of the gospel and we we're going to just take 10 more minutes so so hang in there is a challenging one and that is the offense of the gospel so you talk about the simplicity of the gospel it's christ-centered it's the message of christ so it transforms our lives but it also we need to proclaim it out there we cannot be silent in these days that we're living you cannot have something like a silent christian and that doesn't mean go stand on the street corner and shout and say turn or burn it just means where you are god has set you up to to live out the gospel and not just to be silent but to share the gospel with other people to live the gospel to be a disciple but there's also an offense of the gospel and we we need to know that that the world is not always going to love the true message of jesus christ listen to this in first peter 2 he says and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light jesus said the, some things of the gospel is going to offend people and sometimes in church you know you're going to be set up with offense there's an offense of the gospel and then obviously there's also an offense that sometimes happens through relationships 
And the moment when you commit yourself to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you must know that, sure, you and I are going to be challenged. Sometimes you're going to get angry. I don't know about you, but when I read the word, I feel like, oh, my God, Lord, your standard is too high for me. Lord, I feel like a worm sometimes. And that is good for you, and it's good for me. I mean, <laughs> because it, it, sort of, it sort of takes this, the, the sinful nature. It challenges. It's like a spotlight that zooms into your life. And you and I need to walk through it. There's going to be times when God disciplines us. There's times when God will challenge us to grow. There's times when it's not going to be easy. Growing and changing is never easy. Some people that are here this morning, they, they, you've moved down maybe from Pretoria here into the land flowing with milk and honey. You know, the promised land. You're welcome here. But it's a challenge when you come down here and Stellenbosch is very clickish and People have got all these isms and all this stuff and they're already in their communities and they don't necessarily open up their hearts for you. You know, but I just want to say you're welcome here in church. I mean, we, we're opening up our hearts for you. All the Pretorianas, okay? And the, and the Joe Burgers, I mean, and the Nat Natalies, the Natal people, okay? So, but um, you must know that, you know, the Bible says there that, that Jesus will be a stumbling block, meaning that, there's going to be judgment or sometimes he's going to put some stones in your way and you're going to, you, you're going to trip over it. It's a rock of offense. And it's part of the gospel you and I need to be confronted with. But also when we share that gospel outside of these walls, some people will hate us. Some people will not love the message. It's almost like this reaction. When you drive on... We, we drove here through the trans sky and never drive through the trans sky at night. There are many animals and lots of things and lots of people walking in the roads and some taxis that doesn't drive too well. But um, when you drive and you get a car from coming from the front and its brights is on, then your first reaction is like, when the light really shines, you want to you wanna defend yourself, okay? Or you want to some of us want to bright back and just say, I'm going to get you back. And I'm going, you know, that, that's not the Christian thing to do. But um, when there's intense light shining, you know, or you walk out, out, you've been in a dark place and you walk out and there's a lot of light. The first thing you want to do is you just want to sort of like, hey, let me just focus what's happening here. And that's the effect that the gospel will have on unbelievers and sometimes on us when it's called us to sanctification. Not too many amens, yeah, but Hallelujah. Okay, now we're getting to the practical part. I woke up one night a couple of weeks ago, and the Lord asked me a question. He said to me, he asked me, what are the challenges facing us here in Stellenbosch and in the Western world concerning idols and the gospel? And I thought like, oh, yeah, it's, 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 it's the Muslims, it's the political system, and all. It's, it's amazing what type of answers you give. And then the Lord says, no, it's subtle idols. It's subtle things, and we're going to talk about that a little bit next week as well. We're ending off with this. I want you to write it down and go and pray about it this week in your own life, in my life. Because there's some, certain enemies in the West of the gospel, and he, and he sort of gave me a lot of words that night when I was praying through it. The first one is compromise. When we, when we slowly drift away, the second one is our love for comfort. We are all like that. We are human beings and we love to be comfortable. Instead of being obedient. Then this other thing is called convenience. Many people want to live their life before God. And I just want to have a convenient lifestyle. Lord, I'm a good Christian. I'm a good husband. But comfort and convenience many times will go together. And then a big one in our culture is consumerism, is I want to have, I want to get. And that can be knowledge, that can be things, a drive, something that drives you. It can be finances. Oh, I just want to be independent. And when I'm independent, then I will start serving God. But hey, you have to serve God now in, in sometimes the toughest time in your life. Sometimes when you don't understand, sometimes 
when your emotions go wild with you and you just want to run away and you want to get offended in church and you want to get offended with that short pastor standing in front and telling you to repent or whatever, you know, and, and you don't like his style or his jokes, his flow, his jokes are flow, you know, whatever it is, just like that short man, why does he talk like that? And why do they worship so long? And why do, you know, we're going to be set up with offense because our natural default is convenience and comfort. Our, our natural default is not, is not to be exposed to the needs out there because, you know, it, what, it makes us uncomfortable. It, it makes us be challenged. And that's what I love about Jesus, the Bible says. And, and he saw them. He saw the people as sheep without a shepherd. And then he was moved with compassion and then he healed them all. But God will sometimes set us up to see. And it's, it's not nice. First in our own hearts, you will challenge things in your heart this year. And you can close up your heart, harden your heart, or you can say, okay, Lord, I trust you. I'm going to surrender. Teach me how to surrender. But if we have consumerism and convenience, then it's always about, I want to feel good, and I'm going to get offended with God. I'm going to get offended with my small group. I'm going to get offended. I'm going to rather stay away because it's just too inconvenient to actually live an open relationship with other people. And we're all challenged by that. I think I told you the story of, of this, um, this, the two interns a couple of years ago, you know, they were doing a service here and, and we sat in the first meeting and they introduced each other and then it's amazing. They, this guy and this girl, they, all, they both lived in Durbanville and they were going away that off weekend so so now the guy says no i'm gonna go on friday i'm gonna i'm gonna go home in durbanville and she says well okay can i have a lift you know and 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 she said yes she said and, and he said yes yes you can drive with me where do you live now there in i think it was Pratia heights or somewhere so the story goes like this the friday they get into the car they drive and then she says no i live up there and they drive this way and she says, live, left there. And he says, oh, I okay, also live up there. It ended up that they stayed next to each other and they didn't know. It was the shock of their lives. But it, they only stayed to, next to each other for two years. And obviously they studied here, so there were a lot of circumstantial stuff around it. But the amazing thing is sometimes we don't even know our neighbors anymore. Why? Because we're creatures of comfort. We're creatures of, hey, I, I want to survive, but I want to tell you, God has got so much more for us. But that's not going to be always comfortable. Then a lack of commitment to the gospel, a lack of, sometimes we distracted, and that also comes with this big thing, choices. We all have a lot of choices every day, whether we want to commit to the kingdom, commit to Christ, commit to spending time with him or just do a lot of other things i spoke to a pastor that's in a much more rural area and he said it's so amazing people just come to everything because there's nothing else to do our challenge in stellenbosch is there are so many things to do so many things we have a beautiful beach we have waterfront we have a lot of stuff we have a lot of series we can watch. We have a lot of sporting events. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But choices determine eventually what will happen in our heart. And sometimes too many choices makes us so distracted that we can't focus. And I love when Angus phoned me the other day. He was actually making a joke. And he said, see us? You are the only church I need to ask an invitation for to come and preach. All the other people ask me to come and preach there, but, you know, why should I ask you for an invitation, you know, because I asked him last year, and then I, I forgot to send him the dates, you know, or Nell is his secretary, and, and I was just laughing. I said, you know what, come, we'll arrange it around. So Angus is coming a, a little, maybe in March, we're trying to settle a date, but so he phoned me about, you know, he was preaching in Mitchell's Plain last year and, and he made a statement to put up a big wall and make it, the, say, Mitchell's Plain, the flower of Cape Town. Yeah? And I'm a bit like him as well. Sometimes we make wild statements and then we forget about it. <laughs> but praise God for wives. 
that sometimes operate like the Holy Spirit. Remember what you said there. <laughs> Come back to your commitment, yeah. <laughs> and so now he's following up on that commitment. So he's coming back, coming down. I think on the twenty second, and we're going to go to Mitchell's plane, and just say, but if we've said something, we need to do it. If we've committed to something, we need to follow through. But our culture is a culture of entitlement. Now I don't feel like it. I, I've got lots of choices. I want to I want to encourage you today, and, and this is sort of the homework. If God challenges you on some of these things, just give it to Him. Just surrender and say, Lord, sure. I've realized that I've become a consumer Christian, and I want us before we, as the ushers are gonna just bring out the communion. I want us to pray a little bit about just just consecrate this year to God and commit ourselves to the kingdom of God and the true gospel. I, I believe this, we're going to have a great revival, but that revival may look a bit different than just nice church services. It looks, it's a bit ugly sometimes. It's messy when revival happens because broken people come to know the Lord. And the church is a hospital for the broken. The church is a hospital, not a hotel. I mean, the church is a place where we are going to need to make ourselves uncomfortable sometimes. Sometimes walk out of our comfort and say, sure, I, I don't know how, but Lord, I want to be obedient. And so God is not looking for, for perfection. He's not looking for your greatness or my greatness, but he's looking for an obedient disciples. People that say, Lord, we are committed more than ever to the fullness of your gospel. The good news the simplicity of your gospel. And Lord, it's, we're going to need to deal with offense and we never want to be that stumbling stone, but the message itself will sometimes become a stumbling stone to people. Sometimes people will hate you for the sake of the gospel, for standing your ground. But when you stand your ground, the power of God is going to come. The, the sick are going to get healed. The broken are going to be restored. The oppressed is going to be set free. The prison doors is going to swing open. But more than ever, Christians, I challenge us, we need to be committed to the message of Jesus Christ. We need to stand our ground. We need to take authority in the spiritual realm. Sometimes it's just a spiritual authority you take. It's not about what you do in the flesh. It's not about jumping up and down with your banners and saying, turn or burn. But there's a spiritual stand we need to take for the gospel because if the church doesn't take a stand, the nation suffers. Then everything just goes haywire. And it's a spiritual stand. And this morning we're going we're gonna to just consecrate and commit ourselves again to the message of Christ in our hearts. And if we need to repent, we repent. If we need to say, Lord, I've, I've lost that desire for your power because maybe I've suffered myself. I've gone through a season where I've prayed and things didn't happen. Bring that as a worship song to God. Bring your pain to God. Bring your offense to God. You're all going to get offended. You're going to get offended sometimes with things I say. Or sometimes because I don't greet you and there's just too many people at the door that isn't greeted, you know. But let's commit ourselves to be ambassadors for Jesus.